As I mentioned a moment ago, we're continuing our theme of purposeful rest today. And so why don't we pray and ask that God by his spirit would help us to understand his word this morning. Our Lord and God, your word is living and active. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrows. It judges our thoughts of our hearts and our attitudes. And so we pray this morning that by your spirit, you would use this word to do its work in our lives for your glory. Amen. You might like to keep your Bibles open to page 847 as we look at Hebrews chapter 4 together this morning. And as we do so, I've got a bit of a confession to make. Perhaps you're in the same boat that I am, but I've never seen chariots of fire. Put your hand up if you've seen chariots of fire. Yeah, lots of people. Now, embarrass yourself like I am and put your hand up if you've never seen it. Good on you. There's a lot of you, a lot more of you than I expected. So you, like me, would have had to do what I did this week when I wanted to find out a bit about Chariots of Fire. I actually had to get on the internet, and maybe you've got bits and pieces of the story over the years like I have, and I actually had to make sure that what I had thought and overheard about Chariots of Fire was actually true. So I got on there, and this is what it's about. It's about an English athlete, a Christian athlete named Eric Liddell, or Little, I'm not quite sure how that's pronounced, but let's call him Eric Liddell, And leading up to 1924 Paris Olympics, he decided that his Christian faith meant that he could not train or compete on, wait for it, the Sabbath. For him, that was a Sunday. And so in one of those big moments of the film, and if you haven't seen it yet, uh, I'm going to give it away, so this is a spoiler alert. You might want to block your ears, but... If you, if you have seen it, you'll know that in one of the big moments of the film, he actually refuses to do his specialty event, the 100 metre sprint, because it's scheduled on a Sunday in the Olympics. And so despite immense pressure, he doesn't give way. He holds up to keeping his faith and to keeping obedience to the Sabbath. And instead, what he does is swap places with someone else and does the 400 metre sprint instead. And I could cue the music. You probably all know the music. I'm not going to try and hum it to you. But we could we could cue the music, couldn't we? And we see that picture of him sprinting. Even I've seen this a little bit on the ads on TV. And I'm going to give it away here. He wins gold. And so we all clap and think it's wonderful. And it kind of seems like it vindicates his faith and his stance to keep the Sabbath. We'll move from that moment, that kind of auspicious event, to something a little less auspicious kind of mundane, really. In 1990, a 16-year-old kid working a casual job at Kmart, and in New South Wales, Sunday trading was introduced. And so I had this choice coming from a Christian family. Do I actually work on Sundays, or do I not? Now, this morning, I'd love to tell you another... Perhaps this is confession time for me. Get it off my chest. I know confession's later in the service. But I'd love to tell you that I sat there with the Bible and I sat there with my minister and I sat there with all the best scholars in the world and thought about the Sabbath and how Christians ought to respond and decided, based on all this information before me, that I could or I couldn't work on the Sabbath, on the Sunday. I didn't. Instead, I needed the money. And the way things kind of worked was if you didn't turn up to shifts or you didn't put yourself available to be rostered on certain shifts. I know it seems kind of strange, but it was a bit of a punishment that they wouldn't roster you on as regularly as perhaps you were previously. So rather than making that kind of principled decision, I made a pragmatic one. I thought I'd turn up to work on Sundays because I needed to. So who was right? Was my 16-year-old self right? Was Eric Liddell right? Were both of us right in some way or were both of us wrong? Well, before we answer those questions, let's have a look at where we've been over these last three weeks as we consider this theme of purposeful rest. And in the first week, we looked at the first creation account in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, through to 2, verse 3, and it showed us God's purposeful rest. God sets aside the seventh day, sets it aside as holy, 
and he blesses it because on that day God concluded his creative work, creating the heavens and the earth. But but he doesn't stop his work. The book of Hebrews that we're looking at today reminds us in the first chapter that he upholds all things by the word of his power. And so instead of stopping his work entirely, he stops his creative work and his work of prospering his creation begins. And so God enters this purposeful rest. And unlike the six days before it, there's no evening and there's no morning on the seventh day. And so no sunset on God's purposeful rest. Instead, this purposeful rest is built into the fabric of creation where humanity is also invited with God to be in harmony with God, in harmony with God's creation and in harmony with each other. But we turn over a couple of chapters and that doesn't last long. Adam and Eve reject God, reject his word, reject his invitation to rest and instead they're forced out into toil and hardship and ultimately death. And so we move to the second week, to another story of purposeful rest, this time with the Israelites, the descendants of Abraham. Moses brings them out of Egypt and they head towards the land of Canaan. And on the way, purposeful rest is built into the fabric of their life, their weekly routine. It was meant to govern the pattern of their week to remind them God is the focus, the high point of all that they do and all that they are. They were meant to be this new centre of purposeful rest, an example to the nations. And so under Joshua, Moses' second in charge, the Israelites move towards the promised land, they enter it, and they experience something of that purposeful rest. Rest in the land that God had given them, harmony with God, harmony with each other of sorts, and harmony with creation. But again... It's not long before they spiral downwards into chaos. It's not long before they exchange rest for toil, for hardship, for curse, for exile from that land, and ultimately for death. They don't choose God's way. They choose their own. And so there's this forward movement to this idea of rest, to this picture of rest, to this longing for rest. And that forward movement settles over the person of Jesus in the Gospels. He declares himself Lord of the Sabbath. He shows in his activity on the Sabbath that that the Sabbath is there to do good and to bring life and to bring healing and to overcome the effects of sin. And that's what he does in the healing of the man with a shriveled hand. And so ultimately he points towards his own death and resurrection where that harmony with God would be completely restored, entirely restored. That estrangement from God that we experience because of our sin would be done away with on the cross and resurrection life, new creation life would be brought in. Rest for a weary people. And we heard from that first reading that he invites people to that rest in him. Come to me, in the old version, all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. And so we move beyond uh, to another reflection on rest, to the writer of Hebrews, as he thinks about purposeful rest and as he looks in the Old Testament and sees the Exodus tradition and he sees Psalm 95, the way that it interprets the Exodus, and he brings those thoughts together along with, as we'll see, the first creation account that we've made reference to. He brings all those ideas, the Exodus creation Psalm 95's reflection on the Exodus and he brings them together and gives some insights for his audience as he reflects on those texts. And as he does so, he sees that Psalm 95 talks about the Exodus generation and says that they died in the desert, they did not enter God's rest, his purposeful rest, chapter 3 verse 19 and chapter 4 verse 2, because of their unbelief. They failed to trust God. They failed to embrace his offer of rest that he gave to them and so they were shut out of it. So from the words of Psalm 95, uh, Hebrews 3, chapter 11 and 
Hebrews chapter 4, verses 3 and 5, God declares to them, they shall never enter my rest. Shut out of the land, shut out of God's rest. But you see, from those very words, they shall never enter my rest, the, the, the writer of Hebrews, he concludes something about God's rest. He concludes that it's still ongoing. If they can't enter into it, if they didn't enter into it, then it must be ongoing. That's kind of the logic he's using here. And so he picks up on Genesis 2, verse 3, God's seventh day rest at the conclusion of the creation, God's Sabbath rest, and he concludes, on the seventh day, God rested from all his works. So God's rest exists. It's still operative. God's purposeful rest, God is there in it now and has been since the seventh day of creation. It hasn't ceased. There's been no sunset on it. And since the Israelites under, jo- under, under Joshua kind of they experienced a bit of it but not its fullness, then there must be another opportunity to enter that rest. That's the logic he's using. And so he concludes, verse 9 of chapter 4, there remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works just as God did from his. And so effectively, the writer of the Hebrews is is saying, rest, God's purposeful rest, it's so much bigger, so much more profound, so much more meaningful than a day one in seven of a Sabbath. A Sunday, for example. Now here's the part where you get your rocks ready to throw at me might sound strange. It might even sound wrong to you what I'm about to say when I say that Christians aren't required to keep the Old Testament Sabbath commandment. We're not required to keep that command any more than we're required to keep the command not to sew two bits of fabric, different bits of fabric together. You see... The Apostle Paul tells us in Romans 6, Christians are not under law but under grace. If we go to Romans chapter 10, here's what he says. Christ is the end of the law. In other words, meaning Christ fulfills the requirements of the law in himself as the Lord of the Sabbath. Meaning that he also brings this era of the law to its rightful end. To its conclusion, he wraps it up. There was an era before Christ where the law governed Israel's life, governed its relationship to God, but that era has ended with Christ. A new era of faith has begun. And in that era of faith, the law no longer operates in the way that it once did. So Christians don't need to obey the Sabbath commandment any more than Australians need to obey the British legal system of the 1500s. Now, we might look at the British legal system of the 1500s and say, well, there was some really good stuff there. It formed the background to Australia's laws today. It has a lot to teach us. It's relevant. It's got a lot of moral stuff in there. But we wouldn't impose it on Australians in the same way as if they were British subjects in the 1500s. It's kind of out of date in that sense, even though it has much to say to us. And so it is with the Old Testament laws, including the Sabbath. It's out of date in what it was used for, for the nation of Israel. When Jesus is asked by those who would oppose him what the greatest commandment is, how does he answer? He says that the Bible tells us there is the greatest commandment is to love God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul and with all your strength. And then he said, and a second is like it. Love your neighbour as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And so in that sense, there is a fulfilment of the law of the Old Testament in living in love of God and love of neighbour. Now, we don't fulfil it. In its fullest sense, we know that. We don't always love God the way we should. We don't always love our neighbour as we should. 
but we have one who is there on our behalf who does fulfil it for us. Christ fulfils it perfectly in love of God and love of neighbour. And so as we're united with him, we take part in that fulfilment of the law and by his spirit that he gives us, we start to, in small ways, in profound ways though, love God and love our neighbour. And so we fulfil the intention of the Old Testament law even while we don't keep it in the way that Old Testament Israel was commanded to do. So it's as we trust Christ that we fulfil the law. It's as we trust Christ that that Sabbath command that Israel was given to govern their life is fully revealed in us as we trust and worship God and receive rest in him. In Christ, harmony with God is restored. In Christ, harmony with each other is restored. And in Christ, harmony with creation is what we look forward to, isn't it? In part, it's kind of restored now, but we look forward to harmony with creation in a new creation, of which we're a part right now. So those who trust Christ, we fulfil that Sabbath command as we rest in him. So what about that Sabbath commandment? Is it is it still wise? Is it still worthwhile to keep it? Even if we don't have to keep it in the sense of the Old Testament Israel, is it still worthwhile to do, to set aside that day of rest? We'd have to say absolutely, wouldn't we? We'd have to say both Eric Liddell and my 16-year-old self were both right in a sense if we choose a day of rest, whether that's Sunday or some other day. But ultimately we know that that points beyond the day itself. Ultimately we know that points to God's rest himself and entering into it in the person of Christ. You see, it's wise and it's sensible and it's worthwhile to set aside a day of rest because our society is busy cramming everything into life every day, every hour. is so full of activity, full of shopping, full of work, full of racing around from here to there that we never see a purposeful rest. And if we get caught up in that activity, we would never have time to reflect on it, would we? A rest with God, a rest with each other and a rest with creation. So yes, it's wise and it's useful to keep a day of rest even though we're not commanded to do it because ultimately that purposeful rest that we kind of experience in a little bit, in in a small way in keeping one day a week looks beyond itself to God's rest in his kingdom. Something we can participate in now through Christ. And so that invitation, the writer of the Hebrews says, that invitation to God's purposeful rest, it still exists, it still operates, it's still for you, and he urges you to take hold of it. Therefore, since the promise of entering God's rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you have been found to fall in short of it. Chapter 4, verse 11. He continues, let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that none will perish by following the example of the disobedience of Old Testament Israel in the Exodus. In other words, make sure you embrace trust in Christ. Make sure you embrace all that God, God has done for you in him because the Exodus generation rejected faith in God, rejected his rescue. Don't be like them. Be people of faith. And of course, later in Hebrews chapter 11, the writer will go on to talk about faith at some length. Be people of faith like Noah, like Abraham, like the prophets. Be those kind of people. Embrace Christ by faith and all that God has done in him. But also he'll go on to say in chapter 12 of Hebrews, let faith bear out in obedience. In other words, he says, cast off the sin that so easily entangles. Or in chapter 3, verse 13, uh, before our chapter today, don't be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. It's the thing about sin, isn't it? Sin promises so much and it delivers nothing. Its promise of a great life is there. Its promise of a fulfilling life, of an enjoyable life, of pleasure, of 
great things of power, of money and fame. It promises those things and instead it lies, it exaggerates and it never delivers. It's the great deceitful and destructive power, the great killer of purposeful rest. The drug addict who started off seeking a thrill is destroyed and enslaved by addiction. The workaholic who throws everything into work but then realises when work is gone, there is no connection with God, there's no connection with family, there's no connection with friends. The person who invests their whole being into their home to see it beautified, only to see it ruined by a storm. Sin promises so much and delivers death. You could say it's like a high sugar, high fat diet. Tastes fantastic at the time. but it hardens your arteries, it diseases your liver and it overloads your body, delivers death. It turns soft-hearted faith in Christ into stone-hearted distrust. That's what sin does. Do not be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. And so the word of God that pierces, that nails our rebellious tendencies, it exposes our foolishness, it it exposes our stupidity in rejecting God and condemns us as guilty before him and calls us to embrace Christ who provides the way out, who provides rest. You know, people don't reject Christianity because it's intellectually unsatisfying. They they reject Christianity often because it says you're doing the wrong thing, you're living the wrong way, and God will judge you. So how do we make every effort to enter that rest? This morning, embrace Christ again. Embrace his death for you on the cross. Embrace his resurrection to life. Know that that is the place you will find the fulfilment of rest. That's the way you will enter into it. And why should you embrace Christ? Because he is the ultimate priest of God. What does that mean? He provides the sacrifice for God's people to make God's people clean before God, able to enter into fellowship with God despite sinfulness. Embrace Christ whose priestly ministry extends beyond his ministry on earth into the heavens as he goes to to the right hand of God and pleads our case on our behalf because of his work. Embrace Christ who on the cross offered himself and enters that heavenly temple, offers himself even though he was tempted in every way as you are, offered himself even though he understands your situation and the struggles you go through, Yet he was without sin and so could offer himself. He offers himself for you. He sits at the right hand of God. He pleads your case. He says to God, look at what I did on the cross. Don't look at what they're doing. Now that's not an excuse to sin. But when we're tempted to give up, we look to Jesus. When we're tempted to doubt and despair, we look to Jesus When sin gets us down and we think we're losing the battle, we look to Jesus, as the writer to the Hebrews says, the author and the perfecter of our faith. And you see, when we look to Jesus, God promises you that we can come boldly to him. He will forgive us. We can come boldly to him to ask for greater faith. We can come boldly to him to ask for strength and for comfort. And the promise is when we look to Jesus, we will find mercy and we will find grace to help us in our time of need. And for that we give thanks, we give praise to God and we say Amen.